Hello and welcome to this free lesson by totally.co.uk in which we are going to have a look at an A star narrative and think about what makes it so good. Now this lesson is planned for first language English IGCSE. I am going to be really thinking about that mark scheme. However, what makes an A star narrative for first language IGCSE versus English language GCSE? It's the same thing. So whatever exam board you're doing, this is still going to be a useful lesson for you. All right, let's get started. Do make sure that you download all of the resources that you'll need for today's lesson. I have linked it below. You can get this PowerPoint and the worksheet as well as take a review quiz to check that you have understood everything that we've spoken about. So go ahead and do that now and then let's get going. Let's begin first of all with some background information about narrative writing for first language English. If this bit isn't relevant to you because you're doing English language GCSE, feel free just to skip ahead and go straight to the exemplar. Now for first language IGCSE, you will have to write a narrative either for your coursework or for your paper two, depending on whether the school has decided that you'll do coursework route or exam route. But either which way, narrative writing is on your course. So for coursework, it will be your assignment three, which is writing to narrate. Um, and actually you have to write a narrative for your first language coursework. But if you are doing paper two, then narrative writing appears in section B, composition, where you have a choice of either a narrative or description. So if you're doing paper two, actually, you don't necessarily have to write a narrative. You could just go ahead and write the description if you wanted to. Um, if you decide, you know, I'm, a, I'm someone who's really, really good at narrative writing, so I'm gonna do the narrative writing question, that would be absolutely fine. My personal advice though is, you know, make sure that you study descriptive writing and narrative writing, and that way you'll have a good choice of both when you get into the exam, and you can really pick a question that inspires you. I have also got a video lesson about descriptive writing, which I will link up above. Question now, have a little think. Why is a story like a mountain? A story is like a mountain because it also has a peak, right? It's got the same shape, this shape, roughly. So the plot structure should resemble a mountain with you beginning at the bottom, gradually growing up, things becoming more and more tense. Finally, we reach the top, the peak, the climax, and then obviously we have to come back down again, just like most people climb a mountain, don't just live there for the rest of their lives, right? <laughs> So this all leads me nicely on to plot structure. Now, whenever you're writing a story, you need to follow this plot structure in order to get a good mark. So let's go through it. All good stories need to begin with an introduction. A good introduction will introduce the time, the setting and the character. So we need to know when is your story set? Where is your story set? What is the setting like? What are your characters like? It should also introduce the main character's motivation. What do they want? What makes them get out of bed in the morning? What do they care about? And that might be something as simple as your main character is a knight and their main motivation in life is to win the jousting competition, right? So you need to have a think about what your characters want. Next, you'll have an inciting incident. If you incite something, it means you start something. You could also think of this as the catalyst, if you like, something that begins the action. So your inciting incident is something that begins the main action of the plot. And usually this is an obstacle, something that prevents the main character from achieving what they desire. So maybe our knight, who all that he wants in the world is to win the jousting competition, suddenly the jousting pit is set on fire. No competition can be held. Now the story has been incited because they need to find out who set that fire? Why did they set that fire? How can I make the competition go back on track? How can I prove myself to the queen to be the best knight and the best jouster in all the land? In Harry Potter, the inciting incident would be all of the letters from Hogwarts arriving, right? And finally, Hag Hagrid turning up, bang, 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 you're a wizard, Harry. That begins the rest of the plot. Now, after the inciting incident, you'll have the right intention. This is actually usually the longest part of your story. In the right intention, you will build tension, mystery, suspense as the story begins to reach its climax. Often, rise intention will have misunderstandings and conflict. During the rise intention, it's basically questions, right? <laughs> like, who stole the diamond? Who set the fire? Will the knight ever win this jousting competition, right? These are all things that create tension, things that your reader does not know and wants to know the answer to. 
Now in the climax, we should get most of our questions answered. All of these big questions will suddenly come to a head as we have to find out who set fire to the jousting pit. <laughs> So the climax then is the most intense or exciting part of the story and this might be physical, it might be a fight or it might be emotional like an argument or a realisation but by the climax I would say that all or 95% of your questions are answered because otherwise your reader is going to feel so unsatisfied, right? Now for short stories, for exams and for coursework Sometimes you might not get a chance to do the resolution. Maybe you might have a cliffhanger. Here is someone falling down the cliff. Wait, that's the opposite of a cliffhanger. <laughs> In a cliffhanger, they're holding onto the cliff. Anyway, you know what I mean. So you might want to have some mystery left, but if you don't answer the main question, then it's kind of like, what was the point of your story? Why have I read that? So you can still leave some things a mystery, like for example, you might find out who set fire to the pit. You might realize that it's the knight's wife because she wants him to realize that what really matters in life is her and their family. Um, so we realize who set fire to the jousting pit, but we might not get onto the point of the, the knight actually having the competition because that, that might become a bit boring. That's not really the main point of the story. So the conclusion should answer any of the final questions that the story has not yet addressed. And in short stories, keep it brief. No more than one short paragraph. Nobody wants to read a resolution that is five paragraphs long. That's like, and then they lived happily ever after. And then they had three children and their children were called Clara, Amy and John. And John was very good at playing the guitar, just like his father. And John also wanted to become a knight too. Like, that's so boring, you've lost me. So keep your resolution brief or have it as a cliffhanger, but do make sure that your main question, your main tension is resolved for reader satisfaction and happiness. Now, how are narratives marked for Cambridge? You will be awarded two different marks. So you will get one mark for content and structure and one mark for style and accuracy. Let's begin with content and structure. So when I talk about content, it's basically, you know, what is your story about? Is that interesting? And then structure, how is your story structured? How well are you following this diagram that I just showed you? Um, and have you actually paragraphed correctly? So notice then that in a top band, it says the plot is well defined. I can clearly go, uh-huh, yeah, here's your introduction, here's your inciting incident, here's your right intention, here's your climax, and here's your resolution. I know each part of your story. It's strongly developed with description, characterization, setting, and an effective climax. Now, you don't need to do anything that clever, but it does need to be that, you know, if you've got questions here, you have resolved them by the climax. That basically is an effective climax. So you do need to make sure that you are describing your setting, describing your character, um, and you've got lots of little narrative details that you should also have a little bit of dialogue, for example. Speech. Over here in band five, you have got a plot which is now defined, not well defined, and developed, but not strongly developed. And we've got climax, but notice it no longer says effective. Maybe for this one, okay, we have got this plot structure, but your climax might feel a little bit random. You've not really left your clues, you've not really left your questions, or you've not fully answered everything. So, okay, yes, we've got a peak. I can clearly see where the most exciting part of your story is doesn't really pay off, not that effective. Down here in band four then, your plot is relevant. You have basically written a story. Maybe it might be a bit, <laughs> but you've written a story and you will have some features of narrative writing. For example, you will have description, character setting and or climax. So maybe you will have a climax, but you haven't really described your setting or your characters. Maybe you will have some great description and characterization, but no climax, right? So here in band four, you've got something missing. Now in band three, you have got a straightforward plot, which might be a bit like, I went to the shops and I wondered who murdered my mom. So I looked around and I saw John and John looked suspicious. <laughs> So it's like, okay, yeah, it's a bit list-like, it's a bit strange. Can't always follow what you're talking about. Um, and it's not always necessarily completely a story. And you've got limited use of narrative features. So you're not gonna have a climax. Maybe you've got some sort of character, some sort of setting, but you've not really completely written a story if you're gonna be honest with yourself. 
Then for style and accuracy, this is basically about your spag, your spelling, punctuation and grammar, and your vocabulary, your punctuation, and your sentencing. This is what we're thinking about. So in band six, you are consistently accurate. 99% of what you've written is accurate. There are no spelling, punctuation, grammar mistakes. You have got precise and effective vocabulary and a range of sentence structures. And notice here, almost always accurate grammar. Now, if you've got one comma error, big deal, right? You can still get in this band. But when you start to have more errors, maybe I can find five errors, six errors in your writing, then you're gonna fall into here, band five, where you are mostly accurate. You're mostly accurate right? <laughs> You've got some errors, but they are minor. They're infrequent. Your vocabulary is mostly precise and your sentencing is mostly varied. So this here is like, you are 95 to 100% great, accurate, interesting. Over here, I might say that you are 80 to 95% great. If we go down here, we've got frequent small errors. So Maybe every other sentence has got something small about it that is incorrect. Your vocabulary is sometimes precise. Your sentencing is sometimes varied, varied and you've got frequent small errors. So over here, I'm going to go with, hmm, should we go 50 to 80% um, of your writing is accurate. And then over here, we're going into serious errors. So whereas here you've got lots of small errors, but I always understand what, you're, what you mean. By the time we get into band three, you've got very frequent grammar errors and sometimes I don't know what you mean. Sometimes I'm stopping and I'm reading your work and I'm scratching my head and I'm thinking, what? <laughs> What's happening? Um, so that will put you into band three. So you've got simple childlike vocabulary and sentence structures and frequent grammar errors that are sometimes serious. So here it's sometimes serious. Here it's they're relatively minor, but frequent. Oh no, what am I doing? No, I just deleted it. No, it's okay, I'll get it back up, that's fine. So frequent, but minor, but minor. And then over here, it's like, okay, they're infrequent, but minor. And then over here, almost always accurate. And maybe band, band three, I'm just gonna write, huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you talking about? So that's how I would summarize the mark scheme for first language English narrative writing. Now, before we move on to look at our example out, let me just quickly talk to you about one thing. So common mistakes that I see in coursework versus the exam. So I teach coursework at my school, but I mark for the exam. So I, I know both of these actually quite well. So for coursework, the most common mistake that I see with my students is that their stories are often overly complicated and confusing. Like, you are being too ambitious. You are trying to write a novel in 800 words. You have got flashbacks, flash forwards, your vocabulary, you've used the thesaurus in every single word. And I'm reading your story and I don't know what's happening. <laughs> if you asked me to summarize the events in your story, I would really struggle. That is the biggest error that I see for coursework. So what I recommend you do there is, after you've written your coursework piece, make a family member read it, make a friend read it. Don't tell them anything about it. Simply say, read this, and then after they've read it, say to them, can you tell me what happens? And if they cannot easily and concisely tell you what happened, you have got a problem with your clarity and you need to go back and you need to simplify your writing. Now on the flip side, in the exam, I kind of see the opposite problem. Now in the exam, stories are often too boring or too obvious. I remember one year that I marked and the question was for narrative writing, write a story that includes the phrase, there was no signal at all. And in this exam, I knew that I had students that were from like different countries in Africa. I saw Uganda and Kenya mentioned quite a lot. And I know that I had students that were in the UK because I saw British supermarkets like Tesco <laughs> mentioned quite a lot. So what I'm trying to say is I had students from like all over the world, but you know what, for this prompt, whether you were British or Ugandan, you all went on a road trip with your friends, went into the woods or a forest or something like that, got lost and realized that your mobile phone had no signal at all. And I was like, how has every single student, no matter where they're from in the world, written the same boring, 
obvious, unimaginative answer. Like, how is that possible? And that, I see that year after year of students just writing these boring stories. So what I suggest that you do if you're doing the exam, whatever story prompt they've given you, think of your first idea and then go, good. Everyone else in the world has thought of that and throw it away and brainstorm and try to come up with an idea that is slightly more interesting because your examiner will thank you for it. So coursework, don't be overly complicated. Exam, don't be too boring. Okay, should we have a look at the exemplar now? Don't forget that you can download this exemplar as a worksheet from my website if you prefer. It's just linked down below. Now, as we read, I want you guys to think about this. So you're going to think, how is this exemplar meeting the following marking criteria? So for content, how does it create an engaging plot? How does it have features of narrative writing, such as characterization, setting, description, and dialogue? For structure, how is it paragraphing correctly? And also how is it paragraphing effectively? How does each paragraph flow and link nicely from one to the next? And how is it creating a coherent plot that makes sense? A plot that builds towards an effective climax. For style, we're thinking about where am I using sophisticated vocabulary precisely, correctly? Where am I using varied punctuation? Where have I varied my sentence openings, lengths and constructions? And how have I made my register, my language choices sound like a story? Sometimes I read stories and they sound like a recipe, <laughs> like an instruction manual. Oh, first he did this and then he did this and it doesn't actually sound like a story. Sometimes students try to write sci-fis and it ends up sounding like, a, an, like an extract from an encyclopedia. Mars, which is the planet closest to, and you're like, this doesn't sound like a story anymore. So you need to sound like a story. And finally, accuracy. Where have I got accurate spelling, punctuation and grammar? Okay, ready? Let's read. And just by the way, for a little bit of context, in case you don't know, this story is all about someone who does a Tough Mudder obstacle course race. Here are some pictures of Tough Mudder so that you know what, what you should keep in your head. It's basically like a race through mud with lots of different obstacles that you have to do, like swinging from ropes, um, climbing up muddy hills and through trenches and that kind of thing. So just in case you're like, what even is Tough Mudder? This is Tough Mudder. Okay, let's read. Race to the top. Swiping bold stripes of face pain on my cheeks, I felt the adrenaline soaring through my body. This would be the year that I'd come first, get my name in the newspapers, and finally beat Benson. It was my seventh time competing, and my seventh time coming second place. Tough Mudder was advertised as a fun event, with a party held afterwards for those fit enough to compete in the gruelling obstacle course but I didn't feel much in the party mood as I weighed up Benson, now stomping his way to the starting line. Benson's gaze met mine, an unspoken challenge that knocked away some of my certainty. He clenched his fists, set his jaw and smirked at me. It was a red flag to a bull. I'd spent the past year in intensive training, weightlifting, running and climbing. I would fling Benson from his throne without mercy and claim my gold medal as I did. Although it was the crack of dawn, the sun was already fiercely pounding down on the field below where the tough mudder competition would be held, sizzling my skin. I hustled through the throngs of people now jostling around for a place at the starting line, nodding hello to Marie, an athletic woman with a towering physique who was warming up. I elbowed and pushed and kicked until I found myself shoulder to shoulder with Benson. All right, Sammy, he said, his voice like velvet, his eyebrow cocked. Try not to feel too bad about another loss, eh? It's the taking part that counts. I fumbled for something witty to say in response, but came up short. Shut up, I muttered. Benson's face split into a wide grin and his eyes glittered with glee. The announcer began the countdown. The crowd roared. I steeled myself. On your marks, get set, go. I leapt into the air, manoeuvring through the treacherous terrain and obstacles with the precision of a seasoned pro, leaving Benson far behind. Years of practice had honed my skills, transforming me into a graceful dancer amidst the chaos. I leapt past Marie, bounded through the obstacles and soared through the mud. My steps light and nimble, I glided over the mud pits and then pirouetted over the gorge. The next obstacle coming my way, the king of the swingers. 
The ropes and nets were no match for my trained limbs. My limbs flowed from one rope to the next, swinging, swaying across with ease. A quick glance back filled me with satisfaction as I saw Benson stumbling as he navigated through Mud Mile, a perilous maze of trenches. When he came up for air, face encrusted with mud, mouth dangling wide, I flashed him a dazzling smile. Too easy, I thought. I sprinted to the final obstacle, a massive, muddy hill that seemed to reach the heavens. I hadn't expected a new obstacle this year, and as I scrambled up the hill, failing to find a foothold and sliding back down, before realising someone else was overtaking me. I saw his wiry muscles and glittering eyes as he ascended the hill, and I slid back down again like a wet fish. Finally, finally, I found purchase in a series of rocks obscured by the mud. I gasped for breath as I reached the summit, my pride wounded, my victory in tatters. From the crest of the hill, I watched Benson's determined descent, who was running down the hill at breakneck speed. Time stopped. A protruding branch yanked at Benson's ankle. Gravity ripped Benson down to the ground. The crowd silenced, and now the only noise that could be heard was a sickening crack of Benson's bones upon the ground. He didn't move again. The air seemed thick and heavy as I jogged down the hill to Benson's lifeless form. Body crumpled, eyes dazed, leg bent out of shape. How could I leave him like that? And yet, and yet, the finishing line glittered and gleamed in my periphery, promising that elusive gold medal if I just walked another hundred metres to cross it. Hey, I said, crouching. You okay? Benson stirred, scrunching up his eyes. Go on then, he said. It's your year. Go get your medal and you can glow later. The more I considered leaving Benson, the more I knew what I had to do. But that didn't mean I had to be happy about it. Grabbing came from under his armpit, I yanked Benson to his feet, supporting his weight as I began to carry him, half limping towards the chequered finish line. Our sweaty, muddy bodies hobbled ungainly forwards, turning us into a four-legged monster. Fine, I thought, we'll win this together. Abruptly, rapidly, Marie streaked past us, splattering us with mud as she ploughed through the field with alarming velocity and darted past the finishing line to rapturous applause. Benson suddenly seemed to weigh an extra 50 kilos. Oh well, I said, as I continued looking us forward. I believe you said it's the taking part that counts. And just a quick heads up if you've noticed the red underlines. No, these are not spelling mistakes. I am British. But my laptop has got American settings. So this, these are the British ways of spelling the words. Um, Cambridge actually doesn't care if you spell things in a British way or an, Amer or an American way, as long as you are consistent. Just a, l a little heads up there and a quick defence. No, I have not misspelled words. Now, if you've got the worksheet, then you can see that there are a series of questions here to help you have a think about what makes this such an effective narrative. Do pause the screen now and head over there. Have a little think. Where is this meeting the marking criteria? And where is it gaining marks for content, structure, style and accuracy? Okay, so now let's unpick the exemplar. What makes this such a good narrative? Why would it get an A star for both coursework and also for the exam? Certainly for the exam. Firstly, can you identify the structure of Race to the Top? What is our introduction, inciting incident, right intention, climax and resolution? There is a space for you to do this on your worksheet or if you're in a rush, you can just pause the screen and have a quick little think. Here are the answers then. So our introduction. In the introduction, we've got Sammy, our protagonist, our main character, who is preparing for the Tough Mudder competition. He's determined to win. And we learn that this is his seventh year of coming second place. So the stakes are quite high. He really, really wants to actually get first place this time. What is the inciting incident? This is when we have got Sammy and Benson, who is already his rival, but they have that exchange of words, right? They have a little argument at the starting line. This intensifies the competition between them. Our rise intention is basically everything from the race beginning um, and onwards. So this is when the race begins and Sammy competes and he begins to overtake Benson, leaving him behind. But as they get up the muddy hill, Sammy is struggling. He slips down and this is when Benson overtakes him and it seems like Benson will now win. 
The climax, however, is when Benson falls and injures himself and then Sammy decides to forfeit winning to help Benson cross the finishing line. The whole way through the question is, you know, will Sammy win? And can they overcome this rivalry? Rivalry. So at the climax, we've got these questions answered, right? Will Sammy win? Maybe, but not alone. And will they end their rivalry? We're getting closer towards it, right? The resolution, though, is that Marie actually beats both of the men to the finishing line. But even though Sammy now knows that neither of them can win, he continues to help Benson to cross. And he has a little joke. He says it's the taking part that counts. He quotes Sammy from the start. If you've done my descriptive writing lesson, then you'll know that this creates a circular structure as the start and the end link together. And Cambridge love that. They love it, right? Um, and it also shows some development. His attitude has matured. His earlier attitude is, boo, I don't want to come second. Now it's, okay, fine, I'm coming second. I'm actually coming joint second with my enemy. So we can see some real character development and growth in this bit here. Now we're going to go through bit by bit and pick out different bits of the story that are really good. So setting. Setting is all about where and when your story is set. What is the atmosphere like? What is the weather like? And don't forget that you should describe your setting briefly throughout. You shouldn't forget where your characters are. It shouldn't be like at the start, you're like, oh, it was really muddy and the sky was dark. And then by the end, we've never ever mentioned the setting again. Like surely the darkness might become a problem in the plot. Maybe they might get mud in their shoes and their hair on their face. So don't ignore where you are after the first paragraph. But this is all part of creating a realistic picture in your reader's mind. Now, if we have a look at a small section of my setting, have a think, what makes this section of the setting so effective? So we're learning when it is, right? It's very early in the morning, it's at the crack of dawn, and we're learning something about the weather. It is fiercely hot, the sun is already pounding down. That might create some intensity. It might also symbolize the fire, the animosity between the two men. So it creates that little bit of tension there as well. And in fact, it's so hot that it's actually burning our main character's skin. We're also learning that they are at the Tough Mudder competition and we get some description of the atmosphere at that setting. So it's incredibly busy, it's chaotic, um, and it's just filled with people. So there are throngs of people jostling around, everyone trying to fight to get to the, the starting line. We see Marie for the first time here too, who will become significant later on. And it's so busy that our protagonist, Sammy, has to elbow, push and kick to get to the finish, the starting line with Benson. So we've got some quite nice detailed description of setting. We know a lot about it. We know where it is, when it is, what the weather's like, what the atmosphere's like. And it makes sense too. Like it relates to the story. This fiery weather, just like the fiery relationship between Sammy and Benson. Up next, we have got characterization. So good characterization is when you create realistic characters that feel like real people. So you really need to think about these three questions. What do they look like? What is their appearance? What are their personalities like? Are they kind? Are they loud? Are they annoying? Are they very, very intelligent? And what motivates them? What do they care about, right? Sammy really cares about coming first. He's a highly competitive person. He's also not particularly intelligent because when Benson is trying to have a bit of an argument with him, he can't think of anything clever to say back. Now remember that real people are not perfect. Give them a flaw, give them a fault. I read so many stories where it's like, the main character is generic teenager and generic teenager is pretty and smart and nothing else, right? So give them something that makes them not perfect. Like Sammy is so competitive that it actually makes him kind of a bad person. He for a second thinks about leaving Benson there. And even after he does decide to still carry Benson across the finishing line, he's not being particularly nice about it. Um, and like I said earlier too, he's not particularly intelligent either. <laughs> So Sammy is definitely a flawed character. Now, if we think about Sammy in this section here, you will see that he is merciless, a little bit cruel and hyper competitive, right? So let's read. Um, so it was supposed to be a fun event. <laughs> it was advertised as a fun event, but Sammy doesn't feel in a party mood, right? So even though everyone else around him is probably having fun, he's maybe taking it a bit too serious. 
Like it even says there's going to be a party after, oh, here, here, this is where it says, it says there's going to be a party held afterwards. So everyone else is having a nice time except for Sammy, it seems like. He's weighing up Benson. So before Benson's even said or done anything to him, he's looking him up and down, trying to figure out, okay, are you in a better shape this year? Can I beat you this year? Um, and as soon as they look at each other, there's an unspoken challenge. So both men are actually quite similar in that way. I think they are both hyper competitive and quite rude to each other. Um, because it says that Benson clenches his fists, sets his jaw and smirks at him. So clench fist, hmm, manly, set jaw and hmm, an evil mean smile. But then Sammy is quite clearly easily angered because as soon as Benson does this, he says it's like a red flag to a bull. He's immediately ready to be aggressive, to be rude. <laughs> um, and we also learn that he, Sammy is very, very athletic. He's obviously... Um, he obviously cares a lot about this competition, athletic, he obviously cares a lot about this competition, he spent the whole year training, so he's obviously a disciplined person, but why has he spent this whole year training, what's he been thinking about beating Benson, that's it, that's what motivates him, um, because he says that he will fling Benson from his throne without mercy, this perhaps shows that he's put in too much thought and weight into what is essentially a, a, a fun, muddy obstacle course. He sees it as a throne, like Benson is a king. <laughs> and getting a gold medal almost makes it sound like the Olympics. So he's definitely taking this whole competition too seriously. So notice just in this first paragraph how much we can pick out about Sammy's personality and what motivates him. Not so much about his appearance, Maybe that's something that I could improve. But I think that you might be able to tell from the fact that he's been weightlifting, running and climbing, he's very, very athletic. And in the first paragraph, I do talk about how he's got stripes of face paint on his face, but I don't really say like how old he is or what color his hair is. I don't know if that's always relevant. Like it's sometimes a bit boring to be like, here is Sammy, he has blonde hair and blue eyes and he is six foot, you know, maybe, maybe not so relevant. Leave something to your reader's imagination. Now you can also include some dialogue in your stories, but do keep your dialogue brief and purposeful. So not too much dialogue and it should serve a function in your plot. It should be there for a reason. My general recommendation is no more than six lines of dialogue in a story because what I've noticed students do is they kind of turn their story in the end into a boring, he said, she said script. What, what where is the mobile phone? He said, I don't know, I thought you had it, she said. Oh, I found it, but there is no signal at all, he said. Oh no, what are we going to do, she said. And it becomes so boring and so underdeveloped and there's no description and I, I, just, I just don't like it. So I would say don't include too much dialogue because you might run the risk of becoming that boring script-like story. Do remember that you are trying to replicate real spoken language. So you wouldn't have Sammy, for example, being like, oh, Hello Benson, how are you? It is nice to see you again, but today I am going to beat you at the competition. Like how do real people, real men speak to each other? They speak to each other like, you all right, Sammy? Reckon you're gonna win? <laughs> like more brief, more casual. So you're trying to make it sound actually spoken. You can do that by using contractions. So instead of saying I am, say I'm. Instead of saying was not, say wasn't. Instead of saying did not, say didn't. You could also use some ellipses to show that someone is pausing. And remember that if you do decide to have dialogue, that a new speaker means a new paragraph must be started. Every time someone new speaks, you must go onto a new line, right? It must form a new paragraph. Especially for coursework, I often see this mistake of, it's a big long paragraph, but it's actually got multiple people speaking, so it should be separated. And then once students do separate it, I'm like, look, can you see how underdeveloped your writing is? Can you see how it's become a script? Can you see how it's become he said, she said? But they didn't even notice because they just put it all together in one big dialogue paragraph anyways. Now, if we have a look at a section from my story, the dialogue, let's have a think. Why is this dialogue effective? All right, Sammy, he said, his voice like velvet, his eyebrow cocked. Try not to feel too bad about another loss, eh? It's the taking part that counts. I fumbled for something witty to say in response, but came up short. Shut up, I muttered. Benson's face split into a wide grin and his eyes glittered with great glee. So here notice, new speaker, new line. So this bit here is Benson speaking, then Sammy speaking, and then information about Benson. So each of these requires a new paragraph. 
All right, also notice how this actually sounds like spoken language. People do actually say all right or even y'all right here. Um, and then here we've also got contractions, it's, and I've also got a, right? It's a taking, it's too bad about another loss, a, right? So that's also something that people would say rather than write. Also with my dialogue tags, you can see here, I'm not just saying he said, he said over and over again. Here I've got he muttered. What else makes this really good dialogue though is that it serves a purpose. It tells us something about their personalities and it serves a reason for the plot. So here it's kind of Sammy, uh, it's Benson winding up Sammy. He's trying to get him mad. He's showing that this context of you've got another loss. And we've also got the line that we know that, that we know is going to be repeated at the end of the story. So it definitely serves a purpose here. And here I'm trying to show that Sammy, although he's got lots of big talk about how he's going to throw Benson through his throne without mercy, when he's actually like confronted with the man to have an argument with him, he can't really argue back very much. He seems a little bit stressed. He can't think of anything witty to say. So yeah, I'm going to throw Benson from his throne. But the second they have an argument, it's just, mm, shut up. So it's serving a purpose to show us something about that characterization too. And equally, Benson's response, he's got a wide grin and his eyes are glittering. Like they are very much rivals. So this is really the purpose of this dialogue here too. You also need to have frequent description throughout your story. So just because you're not writing a description doesn't mean that you don't have to have description, if you see what I mean. So you are still being marked for style and the use of description, the use of interesting language. So remember to still be using language devices like simile and metaphor and personification and to show, don't tell. Don't tell me that Sammy is a petty person. Show me through his actions, right? Now let's look at some description in my story. So what makes this description effective? I leapt into the air, maneuvering through the treacherous terrain and obstacles with the precision of a seasoned pro, leaving Benson far behind. So the whole purpose of this paragraph is to show us how graceful and effective Sammy is during the race, almost like it's a dance. And also in this bit, because he's beating Benson, he feels really good. So there's lots and lots of positive vocabulary and descriptions to make us feel just like Sammy. Yes, I am dancing through the mud. Mwahaha, Benson far behind me. Contrast it with later on once Benson starts winning and he says, oh, I, I slid down the hill like a wet fish. So as soon as he's no longer winning, the descriptions become a lot more negative and pessimistic compared to here. It says that he is transformed into a graceful dancer amidst the chaos. So here we've got a lovely metaphor. He leapt past Marie, bounded through the obstacles and soared through the mud. Here we've got triples, a list of three. He leapt, he bounded and he soared. And again, all of these very, very positive verbs being used. His steps are light and nimble. He glided over the mud pits and then pirouetted over the gorge. Once again, we're using vocabulary that is associated with dancing. Um, to show how graceful and effective he is, what a beautiful job he is doing of making his way through these obstacles. And then he goes to the king of the swingers, but the ropes and nets were no match for my trained limbs. My limbs flowed from one to the other, swinging and swaying across. Here we've got some alliteration with swinging and swaying. Um, and we've also got his limbs flowed, which makes me think of water. Like it's so seamless, it's so effortless because he's just so talented, did you know guys? <laughs> Sammy, the king of the swingers. So we've got this lovely description here, which really brings it to life whilst also being rising tension, whilst also telling us something about Sammy's personality. Now to get in the top band of content and structure, you need to have an effective climax. And you really can't have an effective climax without effective rise in tension, right? Because otherwise, why would your climax be effective? No one even cares. <laughs> it's like, all oh, right, this story's really boring, but here's a climax. I don't, I don't suddenly care. You, you have to keep me interested the whole way through for it to be effective. So your rise in tension is vital to give your climax payoff. So good rising tension will create questions or mysteries that your climax should resolve. So here are some of the questions in the rising tension of my story. Will Sammy win the race? Will Benson beat him once again? Will Sammy help Benson once he falls? How will either man react if they lose the race? Like if Sammy loses, how will he react? If Benson loses for the first time, how will he react? And can their rivalry ever be resolved? So these are all questions that we want to know as we're going through the story that the climax 
does answer mostly, right? So it makes the climax that much more effective. In this paragraph, it's the last bit of rising tension before we really get to our climax. And this is just after the paragraph that we've looked at. So prior to this, Sammy was women, winning. Sammy was good. Sammy was happy. Sammy was pirouetting, leaping and gliding. Not anymore. So as he sprints to the final obstacle, a massive muddy hill, some alliteration there, um, which seemed to reach the heavens. Um, is that a, a simile? Because it's not saying it is reaching the heavens. It's saying it seemed to. I'm going to go with simile. Um, and he scrambles up the hill. Now, because we've got this new obstacle that he can't do very well, look at how much more negative it becomes. And so the tension starts to rise because we thought before, okay, for sure, now Sammy's actually going to win. But now the tension is going higher because he's not doing so well anymore. So again, it seems like who is actually going to win? Now he is scrambling up the hill. He fails to find a foothold and he slides back down before realizing someone else was overtaking me. The stakes keep getting higher. Will Sammy win? Sammy's not doing so well. Someone's going to overtake him. Who is it? Oh no, right? Tension, tension, tension. Now we see wiry muscles, muscles and glittering eyes. It doesn't even say who it is. But because we've had Benson described before with glittering eyes, we know it's Benson. But again, this increases the tension. And here, as Benson ascends, poor Sammy slides down. So we've got this tension of one going up one going down and the very negative sad language he's like a wet fish i made myself laugh when i wrote that can you tell yeah, but this is a story that i wrote by the way be kind um and then finally 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 rise in tension sammy does manage to climb the hill but he knows it's probably too late because he's already seen benson go over the top of the hill right so the, on the hill we can't see everything that's going on that's also increasing tension we've seen benson go over the top Sa sammy's down here what's going to happen as he finally gets to the top and he reaches the summit the top of the hill his pride is wounded his victory is in tatters this whole thing that motivates sammy what motivates him is i want to win this year what is he going to do now that he's probably going to lose? So all of this is building up the tension. But of course, we know what comes next, right? In our climax. So the climax should be the most exciting and intense part of your story. A bit weird if your introduction is the most exciting part. Like, why would anyone carry on caring if it just gets more and more boring? So your climax should answer all or most of the questions that your story has raised. So in my story, will Sammy win this race? No. <laughs> But will Benson be able to beat him once again? Also no. Will Sammy help help Benson? Yes, he will, but it is begrudging. He doesn't necessarily want to do it, he just feels morally obliged to. How will either men react if they lose this race? Well, they're both unhappy when they lose, but actually they've got quite good humour compared to the start when they're arguing, like they have a little bit of a joke. And can their rivalry ever be resolved? This one isn't fully answered. It appears maybe so, because now Sammy's helped Benson, so there's a chance for them to become friends. But I don't, I don't like do another paragraph when it's like, and after this day, Sammy and Benson became the best of friends. And Sammy was actually at Benson's wedding and became godfather to his son. And they used to go fish and they went fishing every single day. Like that would just be so boring, right? We we were leaving it up to the reader's imagination whether or not Sammy and Benson actually managed to resolve their rivalry after the story is finished. Now this part here is my climax. This is when Sammy has seen Benson fall over and knows okay, I need to decide what to do. His decision is the climax, really. The more I considered leaving Benson, the more I knew what I had to do, but I didn't mean I had to be happy about it. He grabs him from under his armpit, a little bit of violent imagery there. He's not being kind and gentle, like, oh, come on, how are you? Does your foot hurt? And he yanks Benson to his feet, but he does support him as they walk half limping towards the cross line and they turn into a four-legged monster and he thinks well fine we'll win this together so here we've got some sort of resolution to this question of can sammy finally be a good sport can he finally stop being so horrible and so hyper competitive and actually be a good person and the answer is yeah kind of yeah he can now, in relation to structure and climax, your climax should not feel completely random. It should be a natural progression of events that could realistically happen. 
So what you want to do is you want to drop hints and clues throughout your story that will build up towards your climax. But you don't want it to be so obvious that when your readers read in the story and they notice the clues, they're like, oh, that's obviously what the ending's gonna be. So they don't need to read anymore. You have to be subtle. You can't be too like smacking your reader on the face with the clues. So for example, at the end of my story, it's actually Marie that beats the two men. Now I wasn't sure if I did a very good job of this. I did try to put some clues in. Like for example, I mentioned Marie twice before she wins the race. My story is only like 800 words. So how many times can you realistically mention Marie without making it too obvious what's going to happen? So we meet Marie at the start when we hear that she is towering and athletic and warming up. And we also hear about her again in the middle when it says that Sammy bounded past Marie. So that shows that Marie is also at the front of the race. And then we hear about her for the third and final time when she beats both of the men um, to the finish line. It also becomes quite ironic because Sammy overlooked her. Like his real competition wasn't Benson. His real competition was Marie. But because he was so clouded by his rivalry and so fixed and focused on Benson, he didn't even really notice the person that was really threatening the crown, the gold medal. So do you think that the effect, the exemplar was effective at dropping hints? I don't know. I think it was good. I'd still get an A star. Um, but I think it could have been a bit more effective in terms of Marie. Maybe if you've got some suggestions or like some example sentences, you could suggest them in the comments. I could try to add them into my story. Um, I think I did pretty good, but I think that it could be better. That's, that's some advice that I would give myself about my story. But yes, your climax shouldn't feel random. You should have some hints and clues and it should feel natural. Something else that you can do that Cambridge really like is a circular structure. This is also what I taught you in the, the descriptive writing structure lesson. So you start and end with a similar point, right? So for example, you might have a story set in a coffee shop and the story begins with the open sign being turned and ends with the sign being turned closed, right? That would be a circular structure. So it's when you begin and end with a similar idea or theme to bring your story to a satisfying close. So for example, at the start, Benson says to Sammy, uh, try not to feel too bad about another loss, eh? It's the taking part that counts. And then this part is repeated at the very end. Oh, well, I said, as I continued looking us forward, I believe you said it's the taking part that counts. This becomes all the more effective because actually at the start, neither of them believe that. But by the end, they're starting to believe that. They're starting to see, okay, we're helping each other. Maybe this race isn't all about who wins, but a little bit about sportsmanship and being a good person. <laughs> so yes, it's come circular, but it's not like, it's not like this phrase has just been repeated. Something has changed. This phrase is relevant. It's got a meaning. That's why it's been put there. And now my final tips for narrative writing. Do make sure, especially if you're doing coursework, that your story is clear. Can a friend summarize literal events? If you're doing an exam, don't be boring. <laughs> Character, do make sure that you have at least two characters who are named and described. I should be able to tell you something about their personalities. Setting, what place is your story set and when is it set? Don't forget to refer back to your setting, have description of that throughout. Climax, what is your story building to? What will the peak of your story mountain be? And in order to get there and make it an affecting climax, make sure that you have added tension. So there should be some sort of unanswered question in your story that will keep your reader engaged. And that question needs to be answered in your climax. And do remember, you get so many marks for accuracy. So do save time to check your spelling, punctuation and grammar. If you are doing coursework, then use your spell checker, use Grammarly. Literally, why wouldn't you? It's not cheating to do that. And proofread your writing too. Just because you've Grammarly checked something doesn't mean that it's now accurate. Grammarly doesn't pick up all of the mistakes. So I always recommend read your story out loud because then you can hear when a lot of the mistakes come up or where something doesn't flow or sound natural. If you're doing the exam, make sure that you save time at the end to proofread, go back over your work, especially check for um, commas and full stops. Make sure that you've used those correctly and do check that you've not been repetitive and repeated the same word over and over again, because you're trying to show off how precise and sophisticated your vocabulary is.
If you like this video lesson and you want to see more like it, then you can go onto my website, totally.co.uk, where you'll see lots and lots of different video lessons and quizzes and also teaching resources. If you're joining us on YouTube, please do subscribe to my YouTube channel, give this a like, ask any questions that you might have in the comments and I'll try to reply. And hopefully I'll see you in my next video. Bye.